Welcome to episode 21 of the Pregactive Podcast as we talk with Zoe Naylor, who is one of the founders of the documentary Birth Time, one of the most incredible films that I have seen and all dedicated to shifting the mindset of society, of practitioners, of women, all about birth and how we can support women through the birthing process. Hi, I'm Karen, the founder of Pregactive, and through this Pregactive podcast, I'm going to help you to feel empowered, informed, and confident through your pregnancy and postpartum journey as we talk all things health, mind, and fitness. Very excited to have Zoe Linaylor here with us today and we're going to be talking about birth time and birth time movement and the birth time documentary as well as of course Zoe's own experience as a mother going through her own two births. So very exciting but for those who don't know you Zoe could you just give us a little bit of an intro into who you are and what you do? Oh it's always such a big, big thing to kind of articulate a life, isn't it? Like in a nutshell. Um, well, maybe maybe the best way to provide context is, you know, for um, I'm 44 and for the first half of my professional life, I've worked as an actress and presenter. You know, I did McLeod's Daughters and hosted lots of big shows like Gladiator and yeah, had quite a, a prolific career uh, in that way. And then really for the last 10 years, um, I've kind of taken a little bit of a turn. Um, I've really committed to my own, I call it journey of awakening or healing or whatever you would like to articulate it as. And in that commitment, what's happened is I've kind of starting to morph what I really want to do. And it's becoming much more of service and it's, um, I guess I'm still using the skill set that I've cultivated, but now... I'm really working more as a producer. Um, I've, you know, I'm hosting and 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 producing my own show called Kaftan Mama. I'm, you know, almost finished my yoga teacher training. I'm studying my master's of art therapy to become a qualified therapist in private practice as well as to facilitate retreats. I work as a doula. Um, yeah, so it's really now... Um, yeah, just really helping others to kind of connect more with themselves and and really, you know, have, you know, a life that's a lot more meaningful and passionate and aligned and, yeah, yeah, helping others do essentially what people have helped me to do this last decade. Hmm. Incredible. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's, it is almost that awakening with birth as well, become, coming into motherhood. It's a, it's a big thing. And, mm. you know, a lot of women are nervous about it, which is fair enough. But um, a lot of women, unfortunately, don't have a, a good or positive experience from their birth and in the, into that early motherhood. And I think if we can provide as many resources as possible, not to overwhelm the pregnant woman, not to overwhelm her feeling like, oh, I need to do this and this and this, but to more so empower her to have that, um, you know, that that drive to go into motherhood feeling good and and potentially, you know, having a positive um, birth experience. Yeah, so on this journey of awakening, let's just call it for today, um, mm-hmm. One of the most pivotal and profound uh, essences of that journey has been the birth component. And it's it's interesting, but I had no reverence for birth as a rite of passage. And birth is the biggest, well, the biggest that I've experienced thus far. We have our moon time or, you know, where we get our period, we like to call it. Um, and then childbirth, where you become the mother, it has, you know, learning about how to really deeply dive into that rite of passage has been the greatest growth event of the last 10 years. And essentially the birth that I, you know, had last time was like, well, both births really have taught me a lot, but really, it, you know, I do regular therapy as does my partner and we do together, but that was like 10 years of therapy in, you know, <laughs> 
in that in that pregnancy, birth, and then postnatally. So when we underestimate the power of what birth can mean for a woman or a person, you know, we're greatly denying a part of a human evolution. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, just to explain, I guess, for those who don't know, um, if we go into a little bit more detail in terms of your first, and then uh, we can then talk about the change and the difference for the second time that you went through the birth experience. Yeah, so I'd say going into the first birth, you know, I consider myself highly educated in the Western tradition of university degrees and you know, tertiary and uh, high school and whatnot. Um, I was highly resourced in that I, you know, I was financially quite independent, so I had choice. Um, but I was totally ignorant. And I was ignorant in the way that really my social fabric at the time dictated. And I blindly trusted that the people around me, including my mother and my mother's uh, lineage, were really the, 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 the people who knew best. So you go and fall pregnant, you know, pee on the stick, went to the GP, got the referral, um, ended up, you know, with an obstetrician and private hospital, thinking that that was the gold standard. At the same time that I was really looking, you know, curious and, and having angels turn up or pe- earth workers turn up and were guiding me in other areas of my well-being journey, so too did a very conscious mother who ended up becoming such a role model for me. And she suggested as I was, you know, embarking on those care providers, have you considered home birth or um, a continuity of midwifery care model? And I was like, what? Like, what's that? <laughs> like, hadn't even entered my sphere. Um, and, you know, really at, for the first birth, because I was so um, impregnated really with the culture of fear, I really didn't naturally take on taking charge of that birth. So I really you know, and, and this is what played out in the birth. It, I really felt like I was just holding onto a train and I was going on for a ride. At no point did I really make decisive and informed decisions that really allowed me to claim that ride of passage. So essentially when I went into that birth, I was actually overwhelmed, alone. Um, I didn't set myself up to win. I had a normal physiological birth, but the trauma that I experienced as a result of the emotional experience was just huge that turned into, you know, elements of postnatal depression and um, essentially, yeah, it was like you, you emerge with this baby going, what was that? Um, that was just bigger than I had ever anticipated. You're kind of chasing your tail trying to catch up to yourself just to be able to then show up for motherhood and then you had sleepless nights and, you know, we just get it so wrong when we don't get the first birth so right. Um so that really, yeah, and, and to be honest, at the time, I probably didn't realise the struggles that I was having. It was only in relation to the second birth and then second time mothering um, that I really got some reflection or some way to kind of line the two experiences up. So second time around, I basically was like, okay, <laughs> I know what this is now. And, you know, I was continually, um, you know, on my, you know, well-being path. So, again, I was deepening a lot of my education and the people that I was gathering my wisdom from. And this sounds like there's no way that I'm going to let that happen again. So I made sure I set myself up to win. Now, I liken this to going to the Olympics. This is the biggest thing you'll ever do in your life physically, in my opinion. You absolutely face yourself when you traverse transition in birth. Um, that's what it's designed to do. That's how you break through to this next layer of yourself as a woman or a person and so olympians don't go to win gold medals without a team and so essentially you need your team and this time i got a doula and i made sure i had continuity of midwifery care that could be upheld regardless of whether a midwife was on call and for me that place was at home i knew my body could do normal physiological birth i ticked that box before so i was confident in that part but i the emotional part was just such a missing link that i totally underestimated this time around my partner was much more engaged and included from the whole experience of pregnancy during the labor and postpartum and essentially that birth, and, and Bo's birth, um, the second birth, was a lot more difficult than Sophia's. He was posterior and 10 pounds, you know. That was a commitment unto itself. But what happened after that birth, and this is when I get emotional, is my capacity to delight. And this is not to say that motherhood's always awesome because it's very difficult sometimes and it's exhausting and sometimes we just go, oh, my God. 
but on a whole, my capacity to delight and to show up for the for the career of motherhood and to surrender to motherhood and to connect and that attachment model with my son was just so far you know, ahead of what it was for Sophia. And I know there's the argument of first time, second time around, but this was different. This is like a fundamental innate knowing in myself. And what happened when we started to make the documentary is, is that in the research that we were doing, I was hearing the experts or the, the PhD scholars and the academics say that your experience of birth can profoundly imprint your experience of motherhood. And that was just yeah, so Sophia did not get the best of me and I am always trying to heal that part of my lack of duty of care in going into that first experience of birth ignorant and naive. So it's so important that as, as women and people that we really do our due diligence to make sure we're showing up for birth in the most empowered and informed way we possibly can, not just pretending and trusting it's all just going to be okay and handing it over essentially to other people who tell you whether, you know, this is right or wrong or what's right for you or not right for you and, you know, infecting you with their own stuff. Yeah, so important. And that's that's beautiful. I love love all of this. But it's so often that women get overwhelmed with all the information and so often it can be a lot of the negative in there amongst the positive and and I know that a lot of women stop stop reading stop researching stop asking questions because they don't want the negative to come back at them and that's the big thing isn't it yes it's not all rainbows and unicorns definitely but um certainly the positive stories and the heartfelt emotional side of it is so big to learn and acknowledge but without necessarily adding to any fear or any tension and I think that that that's huge I remember uh, watching birth time the documentary and you know bawling my eyes out obviously because it just touched me so much but not in a a negative way in any sort um but actually just in a in a way of feeling for the women who haven't yet had that opening and being able to get to those resources but the stories I left feeling so empowered and so motivated to to keep spreading the word of this because I think there is, yeah, it's it's that fine line, isn't it? It's about giving women enough resources but not overloading them with the negative side of things as well. Oh, this is such a big point. It's so interesting but we've had so many women say, oh, you know, I'm 30 weeks pregnant. I, I don't want to watch your film because I'm afraid it's going to trigger me, right? But mm. it's actually the opposite, We have such a culture of fear and you have no idea how subversive and subtle that is, not only within the system in which most women choose to birth, but also in the culture that most women are surrounded by. We don't yet have robust role modeling, not even in the movies that I've been a part of, not even in the, you know, on net, not even in what we see. Most women in the audience hadn't even seen birth on a big screen like that. Most women are not comfortable with normal physiological birth. We're so comfortable with violence and rape and things on screens, but we're not comfortable with the most natural, powerful thing a woman and a person can do. So it's it's it kind of multi-layered this, but all I want women to know is that the only thing to fear is fear itself. So the more afraid you are of not walking through and taking charge of that, it's only overwhelming when you're you're actually seeking out the wrong guidance from the wrong places. And that requires you to come home to yourself, which is why I'm so dedicated to helping people heal. Because when you come back in touch with yourself, you can be discerning about which resources you're going to look at. Because Dr. Google is an is like a killer. You know, you could read Rhea Dempsey's book and watch Birth Time, the documentary, and already your streets above many. Do you know, like it's actually quite simple when you seek out really specific resources and making sure that you go and get your 
guidance from women who have boldly done it before you, women who you look up to energetically, women who you go, I know they know the fear that I'm feeling. They can, they can hear it, they can hold it, but they can help me transmute it so that we can actually start taking charge because if we all try and teeter around and, and, and like, okay, yeah, it's all right, you know, we've got to take charge of this. We need bold leadership in, in childbirth and we really need women to stand up and reclaim it because like we say in the movie, women have no idea what they've given away and they still don't. Like women don't, I had no idea what I'd missed out on with Sophia's birth until I had both. There was just no no mm-hmm. measure. Women, like in, in the film, Yumi and I, we, we joke, oh gosh, the next day we could have done it again. There was no way I thought that after Sophia's birth. So when birth is held, we, and we suggest the best way to do that is with continuity of midwifery care, as the research says, like you can, it's not even about the outcome. It doesn't even matter if you end up with a cesarean section because maybe that's what you needed in order to save your life or the baby's life. But you are so healthy. It's the you're experience. Not tra- it's, you're, yeah, you're not yeah. traumatised, right? It's the trauma that actually infects the experience. It's not the experience itself. It's it's quite a differ, different point to make, yeah. It is. It, I, I agree 100% with that. And I think that there is that a lot of pressure on um, yeah, vaginal birth versus cesarean birth and, and these sort of things. And it's, it's not, you know, I, I, it kills me to think that there's women out there that think that they've failed birth because they had a cesarean. Oh. And, you know, it, that is so not true. It is how you feel about your birth experience. And if, exactly if it was a medical reason that needed to happen and that that happened that that's so fine it's a, about making sure also that if that happens to you and in the moment it was all you know too much but that, that then you make sure that there is that that processing afterwards as well because um coming out of it long term as you said at the start the birth affects that you know you're mothering and you want to make sure that you're not just focused on you know that one day or those few days that you were birthing um it's about how it's also helped you feel and, and become the mother that you deserve to be the motherhood's the hardest job in the world i think all other careers are designed to assist the role of the mother i've been grossly trying to unwind my education which is all about you know career career and becoming hillary clinton not the mother like, so birthing is meant to be hard. It's not meant to be easy. What's really concerning, though, in the making of the documentary, when we were making it, it was 33% cesarean rate in this country. It's already gone up by 2%. In some hospitals now, it's at 65%. So the World Health Organization suggests that 10 to 15% is a healthy range. In that, I mean better outcomes for mothers and babies. But anything above that, you start to question, what, is, what are women being denied? Now, you can go in because the people around you have said, yeah, get the epidural, get the Caesar, do it, that's fine, without even being given the opportunity to explore what the other options are and and not even being given the opportunity to explore how powerful you could be. Like a lot of women don't know how powerful they are. You know, we live in a patriarchal and a, 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 you know, a, a real male dominated culture. That's starting to change. But if you've never known yourself, like I've known power in terms of external success, but I've never known power like in birth. So if you're not even guided to even mm. look at that, why would you choose it? When everything around you says, oh, yeah, just get the Caesar. It's like um, it's like the education's not even being open. That's why, you know, we need to normalise looking at, at, at for normal physiological births. So women start to have a reference point for actually what what's poten- what the potential of it could be. You know, and it's normal. It's normal, yeah. I think, for me to find to go. Oh, look at the pain! But why do we then just go? Okay, yeah, sure, quick, have a have pain relief. When we go, well, how how do how do we lean into that and help you grow through that? We do it with our kids whenever they whenever they're struggling. We go, well, how do we help them break through to that next layer so that they can build self worth? It's the same with birth, but we don't. We just quickly check out. Okay, quick. Oh yeah, it's all right. Make it okay. You know. Yeah. It's, Mm. 
<laughs> it is big. I remember at my 14 week appointment with my midwife, and I'm, I was fortunate to yeah, know ahead of time that midwifery group practice was certainly something that I wanted to do. And I was fortunate to get in because that's the other thing. It's not necessarily that you, um, you might not have the resources to be able to have that continuity of care potentially. But anyway, I had this beautiful midwife. We'd met for the first time. We were having a really good chat. I was drilling her with as many questions as I could. (laughs) And just to see, you know, where she was at with things. And after about the fifth question, she turned to me and she was like, you are the captain of this ship. We are here to help you but you're the driver and that stayed with me forever that that putting me as that captain of the ship you know my husband her the support people around they were just there to help me guide my way through but directly I was and she put it right out there I was the most powerful person in that room in that moment and that was you know early in the pregnancy and that stayed with me and I knew going in that I was going to be the most powerful person in the room not not in an ego way like it didn't matter but it just is as you've just said it's about having that confidence and there were times in in the processes that I came in contact with other people other professionals and you know they made me they tried to make me feel lesser and that their opinion and and their um their their rights and so on were above mine and I quickly put them back in their place and afterwards my husband was like wow like look at you go talking to them like that not in a a negative way, but just in a way of, hang on a second, this is us, this is me, this is my body. And I feel like, because I was first time mum doing that, right? I'd never gone through birth myself. There was a huge unknown. But if women just had that confidence, uh, because otherwise, even if they go in feeling confident and then someone comes along and goes, oh, well, actually, we probably should induce you maybe because, you know, this, and you're like, oh, okay, and you go in that direction and then the cascade effect happens. Obviously, inductions are important at per- certain times, but for me it wasn't and I didn't need one, um, although this doctor was trying to push me to a particular time of when I would be induced. And I was like, I'm not going well, to be. I'm going to have my baby. Thank you very yeah. much. So I in feel the- like, yeah, being so confident the- is important. Well, it's so important because you've got to understand and the documentary will help fill in the gaps for you. Um, You know, what's happening within the culture of birth in a lot of our tertiary institutions, and by that I mean hospitals, um, induction, just by the nature of being in a hospital, which is designed for people with illness, it's it's not a place designed for birth. Birth is not an illness. (laughs) You know, it's not, it's like, you know, they... In in the research, it was they said going to an obstetrician is like for birth is like going to a neurologist with a headache. It's just the whole thing is wired to the problem. So what happens is when you're around, and it's it's not like we said in the film, it's not the care providers' prob, um, you know, fault because they're doing the job required in that environment but if you put yourself as a woman and you're opening energetically right your body's a vessel it's opening to birth a human being right amazing we've grown a human being if you go in there and you're vulnerable because you're so open but you're also so powerful as soon as you're in the culture that everyone's wired to fear about what could possibly go wrong of course it's going to infect you which is even more reason that if you choose to birth in a hospital to take your birth team with you like a doula Even you can take independent midwives if you choose to birth in hospitals. Like you're setting yourself up to navigate that fear in a really robust way. So when when we heard it in the documentary, there is a cascade of intervention at the moment. It's gone through the roof. It's out of whack with what the World Health Organization says. And we really need to, to, to kind of stop that or take that back but the only way you're going to say no to intervention is if you're robust within yourself and you know what's going on for you so the dead baby card the big baby card the 
Um, it's not going to fit through your pelvis. Your pelvis is too small. I mean, seriously, women have been birthing for millions and millions of years. Like it's just nuts. Like we're not, not all babies are big. And I've heard it from every pregnant woman I've ever met in the last probably year. You know, it's, it's like, it can't be. <laughs> it's just like the party mm. line, the party line, the party line. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's the thing I feel like being empowered for women to know that their bodies are designed to do this. And in in preparation, I work a lot with women in, in preparing their bodies to help them have a, a, a better birth basically um, because it, it is a lot about adjusting and moving the body and the mind to uh, to adjust as you go through your pregnancy, which is huge. And I feel like so many women who work with me might not even realize the things that I do to help them. But it's a matter of getting to that point where you, you know, you're open, you're relaxed, and you're working with your body. And then you step aside and you let your body do its thing, which is a huge, huge thing, isn't it, to, to actually step away and go okay everything's happening because it's not like your uterus will contract and that's the thing it's not like you have to go okay uterus contract (laughs) it it happens and it's this amazing thing and if um you know you can there's this thing called failure failure to progress if you have that fear that tension that focus on pain then um you're not necessarily assisting yourself with the progression through the labor and maybe that then turns into the pain relief that all of these things um and not to say as we mentioned before it's not having pain relief is not a failure of birth you know do what you need to do but um yeah i feel like so many women just need to be educated but also as you mentioned there are people around them because if the woman goes into birth she's in a zone she's not necessarily thinking of all of these things she has to be protected and has this bubble around her so that her birth partner her doula her midwife whoever are the ones making all these changes and and having the conversation so where she's focused isn't it because I know going through the pandemic that a lot of women are scared because they're like I'm not I don't know who I can have at my birth and that's another thing is that if you can before your birth get to the point where that one person maybe that's also allowed with you is strong and has that confidence to communicate what you're wanting is is I really think, I think cool. it's really I'll just, I'll just tell you this in Sophia's birth I actually checked out I actually I got to a point where I was like get me to the hospital I'm having epidural I'm done I can't do it right I absolutely went there and I absolutely know that place and if I was in the hospital early they probably would have given it to me it was only because I was laboring at home that I by the time I got there I was ready to push her out and I actually in hindsight I was in transition now if I had had mm-hmm. a team with who actually helped me? We're not designed to do it alone. You're not. You're not. You're not a failure if if you've actually gone. It's too much. I can't do it. The women who have had inductions. Oh my goodness! Like you're not. That's not designed for you to to pull that off. You know at all. It's like too much. And it's like I think we labor is massive, and it's got to be held with that team so that when it is getting too much and there will be parts in the labor when it feels that way and there'll be parts when you're in it and there'll be parts when you're like I'm good with my breathing and I'm like I can't do it and then you need to look someone in the eye who you know knows you and you trust implicitly who can look you back and say you got this I see you and I believe in you when you're going I can't I can't give me the thing yes you can that is the missing link that is why women, I don't believe, and people do it, it's not meant to be done alone. And that's why right Mm -hmm. now in this pandemic, get out of the hospital if you can. Find great continuity of midwifery care. Start at home. There is no better place to labour. In fact, the research is saying you can soften and be comfortable because as soon as we start getting into institutions where there's four white walls and stark lights out, it's not, it's, it's it's like an anomaly for the, for the for the natural way of course we're going to go oh we put on a bed in the middle we're like oh you know like it's like killer 
for the flow of birth. Like killer. So much of the research, you know, birth slows down when women get to the hospital. Birth stops like, and then they go, mm, you're on the clock now. Mm, they don't induce you. Ooh, oh, sorry, Caesar. <laughs> sorry. You know, you've got a healthy baby now. You know, it's congratulations. You know, it's so interesting you say that because I definitely agree. But there's elements of me that almost disagree in a way, purely from my own experience, because I was nervous at home. Like I was good at home, and then I got to that point, and it's like, oh, where am I at? I don't know. When, when should we leave to go to the hospital? And then getting to the hospital because the car ride <laughs> was hard, the hardest part, I feel, of the whole labour. But um, yes. getting to the hospital, I actually relaxed. That was me, though, because I, you know, I had this amazing midwife that dimmed the lights, had the bath running, the environment was good, I had my music, all of these things were, were right for me, but I also knew that I was in this space of if things go wrong, then I'm okay as well. And I feel like that was huge for me just to drop. And then I think we got there at 9.30, had baby at like two and a half hours later. So it was a good small amount of time. But, yes, I agree, if if your time does start then, doesn't it, you know, and then there's that that chance of, okay, well, imagine, time's imagine, up and then there's that imagine, stress. Yeah, imagine if your midwife was at home with you that whole time, that woman that you felt so safe with when you got into her hands. You went, oh, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. True. And it's interesting, your first thought was, like, okay, now if something goes wrong, I'm good. You know, it's just interesting <laughs> that that's the thing, that's the thought that we attach in the moment. No, it's just, it, and that's just what I'm saying about the culture of birth because, you know, 7% cesarean rate, a transfer rate of 7% is what my midwife um, has as an independent midwife. You know, that's pretty amazing, you know. Mm -hmm look at some of the hospital rates being 66 percent so what is it that's going wrong and I just think it really needs a lot of a lot of conversation and introspection and you know a real curiosity but I feel like women just need to be exposed to some bigger ideologies and themes around birth and I and I hope that we've achieved that in the film and like you said you know it really leaves you feeling uplifted and empowered and like oh yeah I'm a woman or a person who can give birth to a human ah excuse me I won't go I won't swear yeah <laughs> you know like that that bit is is the bit that we need to kind of reframe so we're not tentatively walking towards this birth thing but we're going yeah you know and then and then you know the fear is, is the adjunct it's it's the last thought not the first thought you know not the first mm, thought. yes yeah, amazing. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about because, uh, you know, we're both so passionate about this. But hopefully that's given um, some women a little bit more of self-confidence and um, that ability to know that, you know, there are the resources, which we both provide, which we'll certainly um, put in the show notes about where you can access the information that helps you towards that empowering birth rather than the overload of information that you feel like you have to sort through. So definitely um, Birth Time documentary is one to watch and um, very exciting that it's going to be available for, for women to be able to watch in their own homes. Yeah, so you just head to birthtime.world and you just follow all that it's very you know self-explanatory we also have a beautiful online hub now which is a go-to place with all the full-length interviews and books and q and a's and it's like you know a, a place that we can gather to for you to feel safe as you embark on your birthing journey however long that may be um yeah we really you know thank you so much you, the work you're doing karen's exceptional i implore women to work with you the body is everything we hold all the trauma in our bodies you know if we can really work with our bodies to open you're setting yourself up and just remember you are amazing you've grown a human this is you know, lifetimes and lifetimes of women before you have given birth out of their vaginas. You can do it. The body is designed to do it. The women do it, not the men. Like, so just like, ah, it's time. <laughs> you got this. You got this. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Zoe. Beautiful, lovely chatting Thank with you. you. Me too. Thank you. What an incredible chat with Zoe. Just so important to know 
all about birth, going into birth with confidence and feeling empowered, but also feeling supported. This is bigger than just one person's experience. This is a movement. The Birth Time documentary, I highly recommend that you view. I'm very excited that it is available for you to screen and watch in the privacy of your own home. I'll put all the details over in the show notes for you.